This slideshow is to accompany Chapter 11, The Nervous System Integration and Control. This is a, a long chapter with a lot of material in it. Uh, it covers the primary control system of the human body, the nervous system. Uh, in this uh, chapter, we're going to talk about the function and divisions of the nervous system. Particularly, we'll explore the central nervous system and the brain. We'll also try to explain the function, the structure and function of the primary cell of the nervous system, the neuron. We'll talk about resting and action potentials. We'll describe synapses where neurons transmit information to other cells. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the higher functions of the brain and the structures involved. Particularly, we'll talk about language, emotion, and memory. Okay, so I mentioned the central nervous system and the nervous system in general serve as the primary control system for most body functions. All sensory input from sensory organs like the eyes, the ears, the taste buds, the nasal uh, epithelium, these sensory inputs and many others from skin and organs wind up going into the nervous system and that input is integrated, so it's compared with other inputs and with uh, kind of the program the body runs. This is integration. And then the nervous system can decide to activate muscles and glands. Often this is done in the service of maintaining a stable internal environment, homeostasis. And then higher functions like consciousness, emotion, language, and memory are taken care of by the nervous system. Okay. Often when we talk about the nervous system, we talk about the divisions of the nervous system. There is a central nervous system which contains more neurons than any other part of the body. This includes the brain the, and the spinal cord. This is where most sensory input is integrated and homeostasis is often kind of the reflexes that control homeostasis are centered in the central nervous system. And all of our higher functions are, are confined to the brain. And then we also have the peripheral nervous system, which carries messages uh, from sensory organs to the central nervous system. And then it carries messages to muscles and glands by way of, of different types of nerves originating from the brain, the cranial nerves, or the spinal cord. And then there's small collections of nerve cell bodies located outside the central nervous system. These are called ganglia. Okay, those are the two main divisions. In all cases, the central cell, though, is called a neuron. Neurons are relatively large cells in the central nervous system that are capable of sending and receiving messages. Okay, we refer to these as impulses or action potentials, and they're electrical changes that can travel over the surface of a neuron. Neurons are large cells with large cell bodies where they conduct most of their their activities, where their nucleus is located. Um, and then coming off the uh, cell body are extensions, and they're, these come in two types. Generally short extensions from the cell body that may contain multiple extensions actually, uh, that transmit sensory information to the, the neuron. These are called dendrites. And then axons are extensions that carry impulses or action potentials away from the cell body and activate other cells. There's never really more than one axon per cell, but it may be branched. Okay, neurons are delicate cells. Uh, they always require oxygen and steady supply of, of glucose, but they're very long lived. Some of your neurons will live as long as you will live, and they can be quite large. Some of them may have uh, axons that may go three feet, although it's very thin, but it can be very long. So let's talk about how neurons, how neurons work. Neurons, one of the, the really important things about neurons is that they can transmit electrical signals across their cell body. These electrical signals are referred to as potentials and, and neurons maintain, have these potentials because they have specialized cell membranes that allow them to move ions uh, across the cell membrane so that they can maintain a charge. And they can change this charge 
by having these protein channels open or close. And these, uh, there are several types of these protein channels. Um, and so the neurons are actively working to maintain a charge by moving sodium ions outside of the cell uh, and then potassium ions inside. And so the resting neuron is about, has a charge of about a minus 70 millivolts. That means there's more positive ions outside than inside. Inside there's more negative ions. Okay, and how neurons can do this action potential is that when a threshold is reached, a threshold change in charge is reached, they quickly open ion channels for sodium ions and this allows sodium ions to quickly enter the cell and they diffuse across the cell membrane in milliseconds. Um, and these membrane channels quickly close so that uh, the channel, this change in charge doesn't get too large, but it can spread across the surface of the, the neuron. Um, and so this spreads very quickly um, and allows the cell to send a message from one side of it the cell body to the other side. Um, and this, this happens at a rate of hundreds of meters per second. And so it can travel, and most distances are relatively short. And so this can happen very, very fast. Then after this happens, the cell will repolarize. And they repolarize by moving some of the sodium back into the cell and allowing potassium to move. This repolarization, um, one of the things that drives it is the sodium-potassium pump and the sodium potassium pump uh, moves sodium ions to the outside of the cell. Okay, and it does this by using energy in the form of ATP. And then it also moves potassium ions inside. So it moves three sodium out and two potassium in. And by moving more sodium out than potassium in, that's what causes the cell to return to its negative charge and have those extra sodium outside. And so that's the sodium potassium pump. So cells can have this electrical change quickly spread over their surface and they can quickly restore their charge to this resting potential. In addition to this, cells do one other thing that's really important. Neurons can signal other cells, other neurons. Uh, they can signal muscle cells. They can signal gland cells. And they do this by releasing a chemical at, at a site called a synapse. And so this, at this synapse, as the action potential travels down the axon, it reaches this terminal, okay? And at this terminal, the cell stores neurotransmitters, chemical molecules inside little vesicles. And when the action potential re reaches this terminal, that causes the vesicles that store the neurotransmitter to fuse with the membrane and release the neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter then can cross the gap between one cell and another, binding to receptors on that cell and causing those receptors to change the activity of that cell. Often those receptors are linked to an ion channel, like a sodium channel. And if they open the sodium channels and the the following cell that will cause a neurotransmitter uh, to activate an action potential in the next cell. Okay, and so that can cause one cell to stimulate another. Some neurotransmitters can actually inhibit the opening of sodium channels or cause the opening of other channels that make it harder to make a cell active. And so not only can they excite cells, they can also inhibit cells. And so neurons can transmit different kinds of messages to, to the cells that they're connected to. And this allows neurons to signal other cells, other neurons, other things like that. Okay, so the textbook talks about the neuroglial cells. It talks about neuron processing. But we just really want to focus on how neurons work. And then a little bit about some of the central nervous system activities. Um, and, and particularly, I want to talk about the brain. The brain contains lots of different regions, and these regions have specific functions. Um, the regions, when we look at the brain, mostly what we see is the cerebrum. The cerebrum is divided into a left and right part, um, and it's 
divided into a series of lobes. The outer part of the cerebrum is the cortex, and this is where a lot of conscious thought takes place. But underneath that are other structures, and you can see those in the lower cross section of the brain. And these other structures are, are kind of hidden away by the cerebrum, but they're important. Um, they include regions referred to as the brain stem that take care of many of the functions that we are, that are kind of involuntary, that are subconscious. These take care of things like um, our breathing, our, our heart rate, and the uh, blood pressure. They take care of reflexes, maybe that are involved in moving the eyes or moving the, uh, kind of locating a sound. They, they do lots of things like that. The brainstem includes the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. Then kind of just behind the brainstem, located kind of towards the posterior part is the cere cerebellum. The cerebellum helps us carry out motor activities um, and helps us learn complex motor activities being stored there. Um, this cerebellum coordinates its activities with the conscious brain so that uh, we can often, once we've learned an activity, we don't have to spend too much time thinking how to, how to do that, how to ride a bicycle. Once we've learned it, the cerebellum has stores the information there. And then above the brainstem and above the cerebellum is a region called the diencephalon. This includes a big sensory relay called the thalamus, and then a big kind of homeostatic control center called the hypothalamus. We talked about the hypothalamus when we talked about uh, body temperature regulation, but it also regulates an, a lot of other homeostatic type activities. Uh, things like hunger, thirst, uh, water balance are regulated in the hypothalamus. Okay, so let's look more closely at the cerebrum. The cerebrum, here's an actual picture uh, from above and from the side of the cerebrum. You can see the outer area of the cerebrum, that's the cortex, the gray matter, which is contains a high level of neurons. Okay, and it's divided in by a, a a longitudinal fissure into left and right hemispheres. And then the cerebrum has lobes, the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobe. And these lobes each carry out different functions, although they're connected and they cooperate. The cerebrum is, our conscious brain is, is really all located in the cerebrum. All conscious thought, uh, memory, things like that are all in the cerebrum. The cerebrum, particularly the frontal part, also decides on all voluntary activities like um, walking, grabbing, touching, um, uh, sensory perception involved in, in the general senses. Language is located in the cerebrum. Memory, uh, planning, um, kind of all critical thinking, that's all located in the cerebrum. The cerebrum some of the ways are, that it does this are very complex, like language. Language is located in one side of the cerebral cortex in the left hemisphere in, in most people, but it involves several different regions. Uh, language involving specific areas that uh, comprehend speech, another specific area that controls the muscles for speech, and these areas are constantly communicating. Okay, I have a little kind of a um, series of pictures that show the language areas that have to work together during speech. The area that comprehends speech for understanding speech is called Wernicke's area or the general speech area. And this is in the temporal and parietal lobes, okay, closely associated with the areas that are involved in hearing. And it has strong connections with a part of the frontal lobe called Broca's area or the motor speech area. And, and so for us to hear and understand, we need Wernicke's area to be functioning. And for us to then respond, there has to be connections to Broca's area. And so you can see this in the scans below. These are PET scans, positive emission tomography, where they're looking at active areas when they're asking someone to listen and then respond. And so um, here there's first in number one there, a word is being seen on a, a, a screen, a printed word. OK, 
Okay, then that has to be transferred to the uh, Wernicke's area where the word is understood. And then to say the word, it has the information has to be transferred to Broca's area. Okay, and then Broca's area formulates the speech, and then that also then has to go to motor speech area. So we see all these areas of the brain communicating to do language, um, both sensory areas and motor areas. Another similar type of function that has multiple parts of the brain working is emotion. Okay, emotion involves uh, parts of the cortex, but also part of the uh, diencephalon, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Um, and so you have here multiple parts of the cerebral cortex, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the olfactory cortex, that's again part of the frontal lobe. And these areas are not only involved in emotions, but they're involved in memory, in uh, homeostatic areas like the hypothalamus that control reproduction, thirst, uh, the nutritional areas, temperature control. And they also evaluate uh, sensory input and determine emotions. This limbic system is very fascinating. Uh, whoops, wrong way. The limbic system, you have these connected structures and some of them are not conscious, they're involuntary. They operate kind of apart from the conscious brain and they're very, very fast. Incoming sensory information all goes to the thalamus whether it's visual, auditory, or whether it comes from the body. The thalamus then kind of decides, do I activate the conscious part of the brain, the sensory cortex? And so it can send things up to the top there, the sensory cortex, but regardless of whether it does, it also sends things to some of the emotional parts of the brain, uh, parts of the amygdala, which generate emotion, maybe fear, uh, maybe um, pleasure, but it, the sensory things always go to the amygdala first. And then the amygdala can also interact with the sensory cortex to, to kind of color those things, to give emotions to those sensations. Okay. The amygdala also then goes to an area of the cortex called the hippocampus. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the hippocampus is associated with memory and forming memories and retrieving memories. Um, and this amygdala, the emotional part of the brain, also goes to the hypothalamus, which is our homeostatic center, which um, is involved with controlling hormones, controlling our uh, heart rate, controlling our breathing rate, all sorts of things, body temperature. And so the emotion center works very fast, and it works kind of underneath, but also in concert with the um, the conscious brain, the sensory perception brain. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of interesting that we have this kind of connection between the conscious and subconscious. And there's this important connection with homeostatic uh, functions like the hypothalamus. Okay, with emotions, our frontal lobe works primarily to give feedback to this limbic system to allow our thoughts and judgment to influence our emotions. And, and this is where frontal lobe impulse control can help us control our emotional responses so that we don't become overly fearful or overly emotional when we uh, confront a stimulus that, that has some emotional content. We can inhibit it, or some of us can at some times. But those, those are, are important connections. Okay, And I mentioned another important connection here, and, and that connection with the limbic system is memory. One of the important functions that's connected to that limbic system is the hippocampus. And it's involved in memory. And there are several different types of memory. Um, the cerebrum uh, can, can hold some very sensory memories that are very short. And so we have this short kind of memory of incoming sensory information that, that's temporary, that can be lost. Um, if that thing is important, though, we might remember that short-term memory in the cerebrum for a few, few minutes or a few seconds um, so that we can act on it. Okay. If there's 
that short-term memory is important or re repeated or it's associated with things that we've already stored in the long-term memory, we can move it over to long-term memory. Okay, and this happens in that hippocampus. That hippocampus is where short-term memories are converted to long-term memory. And particularly for explicit memories, the retention of conscious, conscious retention of facts, names, dates, uh, things that happens, those things can be moved in long-term memory in the hippocampus. And particularly if we repeat it or it has a strong emotional connection, we're likely to do that. But we don't put everything into long-term memory. Some things are lost from long-term memory and different types of things go into different types of memory systems. Uh, we sometimes can develop implicit memories where we, we have memories of motor activities such as riding a bicycle or playing a piano. And those things are stored in other areas. They're stored not through the hippocampus, but they're stored through the cerebellum. And, and so those things wind up being stored in one of these subconscious areas. So this is really important because you know, like in college, one of the things we're really trying to do is is to get you to produce, put lots of information into long-term memory and very specific information. Um, and so that information we go over in a short-term way, um, but you, the goal is to have you put it into long-term memory through this, this incoming sensory input that comes in through the thalamus, goes to the amygdala and the hippocampus. And so this requires the hippocampus to be involved. And that's a temporal lobe structure. And it's going to store that in the cortex. And it'll lead to structural changes in the cortex. Uh, and so this is a really important type of memory that, that you're working on improving in college. In addition, we know what helps you put that stuff in there. We know repetition is a really important thing. That if you repeat something enough, you'll put it in long-term memory. And that's, that's just how long-term memory works. We also know other things that can help improve long-term memory. That things that come in by more than one sensory input, that if, if you see it, hear it, um, if you smell it, if you can touch it, those types of things are more likely to be stored in long-term memory because there's more information coming in. There's this linkage. Likewise, if this this incoming information is associated with, with other activities or other, other information in the brain like motor activities or previously stored long-term memories, previous experiences, you're more likely to store it. It has a place to go. Um, and because things that have high emotional content are, are things that go to the amygdala quite quickly and then over to the hippocampus, things that have emotional content are likely to be stored. Last of all, we know when this storage happens. We know that this happens in a process that uh, neurologists call consolidation. And this happens during sleep, during a particular type of sleep, REM sleep, which is also known as dreaming. Uh, we know that this is how we store memory. And so this, this can be really useful for college students because we know that studying things repeatedly helps that not just reading it, but hearing it, seeing it, touching it, and actually practicing activities and, and being able to, to link these activities to things that we've already done, previous experience really helps. So hopefully we can, we can put that to work. So that's a lot. There are lots of things that, that I, I didn't cover here. Uh, that are in the, the chapter, like disorders of the nervous system and psychoactive drugs. Um, look those over. Some of those are really important um, and can be very important. Often psychoactive drugs are things that resemble neurotransmitters. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's really hard to, um, to deal with because those are, are going to follow up brain chemistry. So, but I'll stop there. Look over the quiz. Uh, look, there's a couple forums. That